Howdy folks, and welcome back to The Good, The Bad and The Ugly in World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles. And in today's first replay, King Fugis in the E50M, German Tier 10 medium tank, is asking the question, how do you win on Malinovka standard battle when all of your scouts decide to kill each other in the first two minutes of the match? The match begins and the team have three scout tanks, a T71, an AMX 1390 and a T49. And things don't look great right from the start when all three of them head for the same position. But, well, things are going to get worse very, very quickly. Initially, I thought that the enemy team had rushed a scout into a very, very good position, spotted all three of these guys straight away, but no. The 1390 gets nudged by the T71 and starts shooting up the T71. The T71 retaliates by shooting up the T49. <laughs> The T-49 retaliates by killing the T-71, and with his remaining ammunition, the AMX-1390 then proceeds to team kill the T-49 and immediately shudders to a halt and turns blue. That's an instant suspension in action. I suspect it's not the first time that the AMX-1390 has done this. He didn't just turn blue, he received an instant ban. So the scores are now 2-0, although they're effectively 3-0 because the 1390 is out of here and the enemy team have not yet actually killed a single tank. More worryingly, this is Malinovka and the team have now lost all of their scouts. So this is going to be interesting. It's not going to take long, there it is, before the T-54 Mod 1 moves over and finishes off the suspended AMX 1390. But King Fugis is in a bad position here. His team have not yet made it onto the hill, instead they're pretty much all camping the woods and he's spotted and artillery is ranging in on him. He's already taken one very near miss which blew his tracks off and he's used the repair kit to repair his tracks. And there's another artillery hit which blows his tracks off and there's a batch hat on the hill sniping at him and he's just taken some damage. There's an object 140 down in the depression on the other side of this ridge, there he is, who's doing a very very aggressive spotting job and King Fugis has no support here. That bat chat is going to pop out and shoot him again, the artillery has another go, it's far too hot here, he can't stay here, he has to get out. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well why is he abandoning that position, I mean he's the, he's the eyes and ears of the team right now, with all the scouts dead, he was the furthest forward member of his team. Well, yeah, but look where the rest of his team is. They're all camping the woods. Anything that he spots, and he's only going to spot an enemy by getting shot at by them, nobody on his team is in a position, other than the artillery, to hit anything that he spots, because they're all camping the woods here. Why are they all camping the woods? Well, all their scouts are dead, <laughs> so they don't know what's up there on the hill. They can't see anything on the low ground under the plateau on the top of the hill. They've got no idea what's on the other end of the field. What's happening here is everybody's moving out of cover, they're getting spotted, they're panicking and they're pulling back into cover. The entire team is camping the woods. With one exception, the T10 Tier 9 Heavy Tank, who pushed all the way down to the south and with no scouts up in front of him, well, look what happened to him. He's the first actual victim of enemy fire. So, 70% of the map in the hands of the enemy team and nobody can see anything to shoot at. Turns out, who'd have thought, scouts are actually quite useful. Although it is highly debatable whether or not these scouts on this team would have been any use to the team alive in the first place. Certainly not the T-71, and certainly not the AMX-1390. Perhaps the T-49 could have been useful, but he got team killed by the 1390, so I guess we'll never know. So the team are reduced to just camp in the woods, staying in cover, trying not to get spotted, and attempting to put shots into whatever pops up, when it pops up, which is not happening very often, and do whatever damage they can. Now doubtless some of you are sitting there thinking, well, if the scouts are all dead, why don't the medium tanks take over the scout role? And that is a good question, but look at where they are. They're all pinned into one end of the map. If they advance to the north and try to take the hill, they have to cross open ground, and they're going to get hit in a crossfire from the tanks on the hill and the tanks below the hill. If they try to advance to the south, the same thing's going to happen. And 
the enemy team do have a very big tank destroyer over there. That's where the Jagdpanzer E100 is, and you saw what happened to the T-10 when he tried to do exactly that without anybody up front spotting targets. I'm afraid this is going to be a very, very campy game, at least until they manage to whittle down some more of the enemy tanks and create a situation where they can break out of the woods. But that's not going to happen quickly. Because the enemy team are cautious about pushing into the woods here. You can see what happens to them any time any of them break cover in order to try to be a bit aggressive. Because while they do have a commanding position and are able to crossfire into... Well, have a look at the T-57 heavy up by the church there. He pops out to take a shot and he starts getting hammered from the tanks on the field below the hill. He pokes out to the north of the church and he gets hammered by the tanks on top of the hill. So nobody wants to take the risk of popping out because the damage that you take is just too great to justify the damage that you're going to do. But at the same time, the enemy team, although they do have a commanding position and a crossfire, they've got to cross a lot of open ground in order to get into the woods. And there's a lot of guns in the woods waiting for them to do that. And you can see what happens to the enemy tanks that do try to exploit their superior position, cross that open ground, get into the woods and fight the enemy. The team have managed to pull the scores back four to five. So this is going to be a very, very campy game. And all because the team's scouts killed each other in the first two minutes of the match. T-57 Heavy up there took a hammering when he popped around the southern end of the church. And he's going to take a hammering when he pops around the northern end of the church. That church up there where the T-57 Heavy is hiding used to be a very good position on Malinovka because there were some bushes around the corner which you could use as concealment, but not anymore. And now, yep, T-57 Heavy is down. They removed those bushes from around the church up there. I mean, there are still one or two, but they're very patchy. But the reason they removed those bushes was to make Malinovka less campy. What would tend to happen is tanks would just dig in around the church and they would use the church walls as solid cover to absorb enemy shots and they would use the bushes around the corners of the church to pop out unseen and shoot at targets. And you would find a lot of heavy tanks would camp up there and they would just not take the hill. So they removed a lot of the concealment in place around the church to discourage people from camping up there and make them move forward and get up on that hill. And what that means now, as the T-57 Heavy found out the hard way, is if you do get pinned down behind that church, you're pretty much there for the rest of the game. <laughs> or until you die. And you can see exactly what's happening to the enemy tanks that do try to push the woods. They're running into a volley of fire from concealed tanks. And if the enemy team did it all together, they could probably force the win here, but they're just coming into the woods one at a time. And then they're stopping to shoot at whatever target first pops up and making themselves easy kills for all the rest of the tanks that they can't see. And there goes the IS-7. Scores are now 6-7. If you have a look at the map down in the uh, southwestern end, you can see that the tortoise on the team has gotten sick and tired of camping the base with the Object 704. And he's pushing around to the same point where the T-10 died. Now the enemy Jaegeru is down there somewhere and he has not been spotted this entire game. They managed to take out two of the enemy team's scouts, the 3090 and the Sperpanzer 1C, but there's still a black dog. The old Grand Finals Tier 8 version of the M41 Walker Bulldog, who's loitering around the middle of the map somewhere and hasn't been seen for a while. King Fugis and his platoon mate in the T-50 there are now the two northernmost members of their team. Now the scores are even, so they're probably not going to get a better chance than this to break out of the woods, and oh yes, speaking of the Walker Bulldog, there's a hit, there's a hit from the Bat Chat, there's the Bat Chat, there's another hit from the Bat Chat. He's bounced one, didn't get the return shot, his platoon mate's going after that little bastard over there in the Walker Bulldog, Come on, he's hit him. That guy needs to die. That guy needs to die so this game can become even more campy. <laughs> Enemy leopard spotted. Is this a push or is it just one tank? It's a shot into the leopard, takes the return fire on the turret. The Walker Bulldog has managed to get out of there on a fraction of health. Ah, this might be a push. 
The leopard is not alone. Well, he's dead. <laughs> this is what happens when you try to push into these woods without scouts spotting the targets in the woods for you. Okay, if you just, just took a big old hit from the Conqueror, he cannot afford to take another hit from anything, but it's the friendly artillery. And it's unsurprising in this kind of situation with everybody camping hard, but it's the friendly artillery who's the real MVP in this match. That M53, fantastic support to his team. And he's about to do it again as that Tiger II breaks cover. M53 is aiming on him. And any second now, there he goes, direct hit, Tiger II dead. Now, with King Fugis having taken on the medium tank scouting road up until now, it's cost him almost all of his health. So his platoon mate in the T50 is going to have to take over. But first, they're going to have to deal with that Conqueror on the other side of the ridge. And that's when the Jaegeru finally reveals himself after killing the T10 at the beginning of the match. And he's just obliterated the Tortoise who tried to do the same thing. Unfortunately, Artillery has just fired at the Tiger too. The Jaegeru is now undetected. Artillery's not in a position to put some shots into him. There's the Bat Chat. And while King Fugis is aiming up at the Bat Chat, his platoon mate, the TVP, spots a sneaky Walker Bulldog and kills him. And that's when the Conqueror decides that he's had enough of this shit. <laughs> and he's going to go for it. And look what happens to him when he breaks cover. Look at the, <laughs> look at the fire going into this guy. King Fugis obviously wants to take a shot here, but he doesn't want to lose his health doing it. And the Conqueror's gone as quickly as that. They're now ahead 11 to 8. And oh, there's the Bat Chat again. Now he's managed to get himself in the unenviable position of being in exactly the same situation that the T-57 Heavy was in earlier. You can't advance to the north, you can't advance to the south, there is no concealment up there, there's just hard cover. Oh, he's managed... no he hasn't. There, that's what happens when you get yourself pinned down behind that church on Malinovka. The scores are now 12-8, they've got a 4 kill advantage. If they're not going to break out now, they're never going to do it. That object 140, however, this must have been an intensely frustrating match for him as well. You remember the object 140 down in the low ground in the depression leading into the lake, right at the start of the match, who spotted King Fugis something like 10 minutes ago. He's still there. <laughs> he hasn't been able to get out the entire game. Well, they're going to go for it. Even the Death Star's moving up. Oh, there's the Jaeger route. Fugis didn't appear to get spotted. He's spotted now, of course. And now the Object 140 has nowhere to go. TVP on one side, Death Star, and an E50 on the other side. Fugis does some damage, tries to pull back. He takes a hit, which tracks him. The Object 140 is going to get the reload, and Fugis' adventure ends just there. But check out the Death Star. Leaps off the cliff, shotguns him, takes the kill. Scores a 13-10, but then the Death Star has a sudden rush of shit to the brain. He starts backing up, out of the low ground, and remember the Jaegeru. There he is. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Should have stayed down in the low ground where the Jaegeru didn't have a shot at him until he was no longer detected by the Object 140. Remember, dead tanks continue to spot you for a few seconds after they're dead. But once again, it's artillery to the rescue. He'd zeroed in on the Jaegeru's position when he first revealed himself and when he took the shot against the Death Star, popped up again, and artillery punched his ticket. And that just leaves the enemy batch out 155 artillery. And finally, after 13 minutes of camping, the medium tanks are finally able to engage second gear and get out there looking for things to kill. And all because the scouts killed each other in an orgy of self-destruction in the first two minutes of this match. Who'd have guessed? Apparently, scouts are actually quite useful on Malinovka, although it's entirely debatable whether or not the AMX-1390 and T-71 would have been any use to the team alive. So, from one match with useless scouts and awesome artillery on Malinovka to another with an epic scout, an artillery that was apparently dropped on its head as a child. It used to be the case that every class of vehicle in World of Tanks had its own natural enemy. Tank destroyers didn't have turrets, and so their natural enemy was the medium, or even the light tank. The natural enemy of the medium tank was the heavy tank. The natural enemy of the heavy tank was the artillery, and the natural enemy of the artillery was the light tank, like the Walker Bulldog here. Then, of course, things changed. Not overnight, but gradually. A whole bunch of things changed in the game 
that meant that light tanks weren't really able to get behind the enemy lines and go hunting the artillery in the way that they'd been used to. The introduction of physics meant that it was more tricky to actually get around the map. The removal of lots of concealment in order to make the game less campy meant that light tanks got spotted more easily when trying to work their way around the map. Well, Valus here in the Tier 7 M41 Walker Bulldog apparently didn't get that memo. It's probably true, however, that all light tank drivers, particularly those that have been playing World of Tanks for a couple of years, still carry the dream of getting around behind the enemy lines and going on a rampage amongst their artillery. And Valus is going to be assisted in doing that in this match by a pair of artillery on the enemy team who apparently do not realise what that map in the bottom right corner of their screen is for. Hands up anybody for whom this sounds familiar. Your team all form a lemming train down one end of the map, leaving the other end of the map completely exposed. The artillery players on your team, who all have a mini-map that works just as well as anybody else, pay no attention to it whatsoever, and instead sit in the regular artillery camping position, despite the fact that they're completely exposed to anybody on the enemy team who is approaching completely uncontested around the other side of the map. And it's a Walker Bulldog, and it's a little bit too late to start paying attention to what's going on around you now, Mr. Lorraine. He's only got four shots left, first one misses, but the GW Tiger P is at least aware that he's about to die, and he's trying to run so he can afford to take his time. And as quickly as that, the enemy have lost all their artillery. Where are the enemy scouts? Oh, here comes one of them. It's a little bit too late to be scouting the southern end of the map now, Sunshine. <laughs> In fact, never mind the scouts. Where is the entire rest of the enemy team? Look at the mini-map. It's all well and good saying they all lemming trained up one end of the map, but they didn't get very far, did they? <laughs> They're all in the woods with the artillery. If one or two of them had been in the woods a little to the south of the artillery, this could have ended very, very differently, but they didn't, and so it won't. Well, Valus is bloods up now. He's got two kills and he's thirsty for more. He's reloaded, he's going after the leopard, who takes a dive into the lake, and that's not going to work out too well for him. Yeah, he's down. Now, of course, he's got a spare panzer on his tail, and the spare panzer has an autoloader, but it doesn't have as much ammunition as the Walker Bulldog. See if you can keep track of how many shots have been fired at Valus so far in this match. And most of them have missed. <laughs> oh, he's going to go for the ram. He's done it. Oh, that's unfortunate. He's blown his own tracks off. And he's spotted. And he's in front of a whole bunch of enemy tanks. But they're all hopelessly incompetent. <laughs> Look at this. They can't even hit a stationary walker bulldog. Oh, they can. But, yeah, there's no justice in the world. The Cromwell shot bounced. Bayless, of course, is now reloading. And they're all closing in. It's like they've forgotten that any other tank on the team exists, other than Bayless's Walker Bulldog. Bayless is a one-shot. He's not going to survive this, but he's going to have some fun doing it. The Cromwells missed him again. And again. <laughs> That's what it takes to kill a Walker Bulldog, who apparently didn't get the memo that he's not supposed to go after enemy artillery anymore. So, we've had one match with completely useless team-killing scouts and absolutely epic rockstar artillery. We've had one match with a hilarious scouting run in a M41 Walker Bulldog light tank taking advantage of completely inept enemy artillery. In this battle, Iron Slaves in the Czechoslovakian T-34-100 is going to find out what happens if you're unfortunate enough to have all of the worst elements of the previous two replays under one roof. There is an artillery platoon on Iron Slave's team. There they are. Say hello to YouTube, boys. This really needs no further introduction. The problem here is that when a game gets as big and popular as World of Tanks, with like 40 million registered users in Russia alone, it's no longer possible to individually deal with customer complaints. It used to be the case, before there were automated systems introduced into World of Tanks, that Wargaming's support section would deal with individual complaints about player behaviour. As the game got more popular, that just wasn't practical anymore. And so, as the game grew, Wargaming did what all big companies do. They try to automate as much of the complaints process as possible. 
If you quit out of the battle in progress, for example, you're automatically penalised by receiving no credits, no experience, and paying the full repair costs for your tank. Of course, sometimes there's a reason why everybody has to quit out of the game. There are things that happen outside of World of Tanks that are just more important, and sometimes you have to quit the battle. If that's the case, it's not really going to hurt your pocket too much. Players who consistently abandon their teams when it looks like the game isn't going in their favour, however, are soon going to find out that they're going to run out of credits very, very quickly. So, in that respect, the automated system works. There's no point whatsoever in complaining about players who are AFK the entire match. There are systems in place to deal with that. Likewise, team damage. The automated anti-team killing system that was introduced into World of Tanks quite some time ago does do a reasonably good job of punishing players who regularly and consistently shoot up their own teammates. It's not perfect, and this particular replay is a good example of when it's not perfect, but when you have millions upon millions of people playing your game, an automated system is the only real method you have of policing it. Now, you don't really need to worry about if you accidentally hit and damage a teammate. As long as that's not happening in every game that you play, nothing's going to happen to you. Just be a bit more careful in future. If you do consistently keep doing it, however, the first thing that's going to happen is your name will turn blue in your own garage, and in your own garage only. That's a warning to you that you need to pay a bit more attention to what you're doing. Nobody else on your team will see your name turn blue, unless you keep doing it, and then the next level of sanction appears against you. You turn blue in the match, and anybody on your team is then free to team kill you with no penalty applied to them. The next level of sanction we saw happen in the first replay, the AMX 1390, that basically expended all of his ammunition into the other scouts on his team and team killed the T-49. He instantly turned blue and his tank stopped moving. He'd been suspended for team damage. That's how the system is supposed to work. Unfortunately, the problem with automated systems is that there's always a way around them. Dedicated arseholes are going to look for ways of exploiting gaps in the system to grief you and ruin your day without any automated systems picking up on what they're doing. And that's exactly what this platoon of FB-304s are doing to Iron Slaves in the T-34-100, who, I have to say, has displayed a remarkable level of patience with these douche nozzles. How many of us would have started shooting these guys up long before now? I suspect the majority of us would probably say, yep, I would have lost my temper and started wreaking vengeance on these guys long before now. The problem there, of course, well, it's twofold. First, you're not allowed to shoot teammates. And secondly, that's exactly what they want you to do. We used to have a saying in the Navy, if you flash, you lose. And when we were bored, that's what we do. We try to wind each other up, and the first person to lose their temper was the loser. And that is exactly what these guys are doing. Iron Slaves hasn't lost just yet, but he's reaching the end of his tether. One of them's just been taken out by artillery, and it's at a roundabout now where he's had enough. He's been begging his team to report these guys, but nobody's paying any attention, and so this is where he loses his temper. He rams one of them, and then he team kills. And now he's turned blue, and now the other guy is free to start shooting at him. How can that be right? He's only taken one shot at these guys. How can he have turned blue already? Well, you see, the thing is, these guys have been doing a lot of pushing and shoving, and they've taken a lot of damage from doing that pushing and shoving, and the way the game calculates who is to blame for all of that team ramming damage depends on how fast you're both going compared to each other, and who takes the most damage from the ram. That's exactly why they're doing this in FB-304s. They're fast enough to keep up with the people that they're trying to grief, and they're lightly armoured enough that you're going to take the blame for any collision damage. And so Iron Slave's flashed, and he's lost. Automated systems are incapable of dealing with people who know how automated systems work, like the guys in these FB-304s. That's why there is still a customer complaint department. Iron Slaves, if you're watching this video, and I sincerely hope you are, I am reliably informed by a little birdie within Wargaming that if you submit this replay to Wargaming's Customer Complaints Department, something will be done about the douchebags in the FV-304s. It's customary at this point in an episode of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, after an appalling display like that, for me to show you something that's going to cheer you up, and today is no exception. This time, it's fast-medium tank platoon time once again. In particular, 
Mount Goat 1985, great name, in the Object 140 in a three-man Tier 10 medium tank platoon here on the Fishing Bay map. Now, I should warn you well in advance that if you suffer from motion sickness, you should probably sit well back from your screen if you're watching this particular battle. At the moment, I'm in third-person external camera view, and I will be switching at regular points throughout this video to third-person external camera view because the way Mount Goat controls his camera is enough to make you sick. <laughs> so remember, I'm switching to third-person external camera view. He's not using an aimbot. This is me switching to external camera in the replay. Okay? Okay. Nevertheless, I do want you to see the way he controls the external camera because it's how he maintains his situational awareness. Every now and then, you're going to see him pull the camera back and do a quick 360 four-point spin around just to see what's going on around him and make sure he knows exactly what's happening at all times. He doesn't really rely on the minimap as much as he does, and it can be quite stomach-churning because it's a very, very fast movement, but that's how he pays attention to what's going on around him. Just took a bounce there from the FV4202, and another one, and there it is. It can be quite disorientating, but that's what he does to ensure that he knows what's happening at all times. He's not getting outflanked. You'll see him do it quite often. I do apologise, those of you with weak stomachs, this can be quite stomach-churning watching him do it, but I figure it's important that you appreciate how he's able to maintain situational awareness. Now, while the platoon are busy working this ridgeline and taking shots of opportunity into all kinds of enemy tanks on the other side, just take a look at the team lists, particularly the enemy team. You'll notice two things. First, no artillery. That's great if you're in a medium tank platoon, because it means you can afford to be a hell of a lot more aggressive than you would otherwise, and that's what they're doing working this ridgeline up here. Secondly, only one tank destroyer. Alright, it's a big tank destroyer, but there's only one. So this is matchmaking made in heaven for tier 10 medium tank platoon drivers. They can afford to rush around the map without worrying about being one shot from above by a lucky artillery hit. Takes a shot on the move at the T-44, he's definitely not going to be stopping in the open with a T-44 and who knows who else aiming at him. Takes a shot on the move, is lucky enough that it goes in. Look at the position he's in here. There's no cover whatsoever. Instead, he's just using the minimal low ground that he's in to keep himself as hold down as he possibly can be and using his turret to take any hits coming in his direction while keeping that camera out, keeping the tank moving and just ducking and weaving between enemy shots and still putting effective fire in on targets at all points of the compass. You're watching a very, very good player in action here. Most medium tank drivers here on Fishing Bay wouldn't even consider putting a medium tank into this position. There's no concealment whatsoever. Every time he pops up, somebody's spotting him. He's got enemy tanks to the left and enemy tanks to the right. If I tried to do this, and I suspect if most of us tried to do this, we would just get pinned down and annihilated in a crossfire. But he's not getting pinned down and annihilated in a crossfire. How can he do it and we can't? It's all down to his reactions and his situational awareness. The way he pulls that camera back, spins it around just for a fraction of a second and is able to take in and process all of the information that he receives when he does that in a way that I'm just too slow to be able to manage. When he pops up, he doesn't sit there aiming and getting hit. I'm conditioned to aim before I pull the trigger because I hate missing. He's quite happy to take the occasional miss because he's also making the occasional hit and he's not taking return fire because he's doing it so quickly by not popping up and taking the time to aim. And that's why he's winning. And he's got three kills and he's done thousands and thousands of damage. Putting this medium tank in a position where most medium tank players wouldn't even dream of going. You see this on maps like Prokhorovka as well. Generally speaking on Prokhorovka, you tend to have three different types of medium tank players. You've got the regular medium tank players who play it safe and go for the hill. Then you've got the medium tank players who've seen players like this running up astronomical scores by working the ridgeline in the centre of the field on Prokhorovka, and so they try to do the same. But they're not good enough, and they die very, very quickly. And then you've got players like this, who do go for the centre line of the middle of the field, 
on Prokhorovka and get Top Guns, Randy Walters medals and score five, six, seven thousand damage. I know my limitations. Um, <laughs> I fall very firmly into the first category. I play it safe and I go for the hill where I know I can have a reasonable game. But I do watch players like this in awe of their abilities as they run up absolute cricket scores just darting all around the map and cleaning up everywhere they go. It's almost like he's got some sort of crystal ball telling him exactly where he needs to go to get flank shots into the most vulnerable enemy tanks. He hasn't, of course. He's just exceptionally good, that's all. Fantastic situational awareness, and he's got the reflexes that he needs to make the most out of it. I'm never going to be as good as this. At one point, I was... No, I, was, I wasn't even nearly as good as this. I used to be pretty good at World of Tanks. Certainly better than the average, although let's face it, it's not hard to be better than the average in World of Tanks. Well, it, it, it shouldn't be hard to be better than the average in World of Tanks, because the average is set so incredibly low. <laughs> I mean, and yet, well, that's why it's an average, because so many players are like this guy in the M46 Pattern Korea, who does 177 damage total in this game. He's not even aiming for the weak spots on top of the turret. He was on full health when Mount Goat came around this corner. Look at this. That right there is your typical Tier 8 Premium World of Tanks player. He probably doesn't have anything higher than Tier 4 in his garage. And yet we really shouldn't be too critical of players who play Tier 8 Premium Tanks when they've only been playing World of Tanks for a week, because if not for them, this wouldn't be a free-to-play game. <sighs> Still, can they be on the enemy team, please? <laughs> Look at that score. Oh, man. I'm never going to be as good as this. Most of us are never going to be as good as this, but it's it's entertaining watching somebody as good as this. Mount Goat 1985, the Object 140, and his platoon mates, of course, who all finished top of the team, having an absolute riot on Fishing Bay with only one tank destroyer and no artillery on the enemy team. That's it for this episode of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.